Hi everybody, let's continue talking about correlations, but let's focus specifically on section 7.2 where we will discuss interpreting correlations. Let's jump right in. First of all, we need to be aware of if there are outliers in our data. Scatter plots provide us with a nice opportunity to determine if outliers do exist. In this situation, you can see that all of our data is essentially packed together. We don't have any scores that are extremely different from the rest. We have no outliers. And in this particular situation, we would see that the correlation, the sample correlation coefficient that we compute would be equal to zero. There, there's no trend here. There, I'm not able to see an increase in the scores, a decrease in the score. I'm not able to see any type of pattern in the data here. But now check this out. Let's include an outlier. You can see that this one data point is very different than the rest of the data points. And with that data point in there, I can now see a clear trend. But do you notice how this trend is so heavily influenced by this point right here? Well, you'd be curious to know, I think, that if you were to compute the correlation coefficient again with this particular data point in there, we would now have a very strong relationship. This would be a positive correlation. We can see a positive trend. And it would be very strong, too. We would have a correlation coefficient of 0.88. But there's a problem, of course, because that one individual data point really has too much influence in the overall correlation. Well, in these situations, when we have an outlier and it has a lot of influence on the overall correlation, we need to be sure that we interpret our correlation very cautiously because so much seems to be riding on this one value. Let me give you another example of what I'm talking about. And again, scatter plots really help us diagnose these problems because, again, over here we can see that there seems to be a trend in our data. Um, if we were to look at all the data points together, we would find a sample correlation equal to approximately 0.23. So it's a, a modest positive correlation. And this data comes from 10 professional cyclists of approximately the same height and weight trying to control for those variables. And we're looking to see if the cycling times, the amount of hours that they spend per day cycling, has some relationship with their caloric intake. And you would assume that people who are working out for hours per day are going to be taking in many calories per day. And here we see a, a pot, what looks like a positive trend in here, but we also have some outlier scores in here. And it's really bringing down this correlation as well. So it's hard to determine what these values really represent. They're, they're very difficult to explain. Now, sometimes that data is, of course, real data, and it's just data that doesn't go along with you know, your general theory about what's happening. But let's just assume at this point that maybe these data points are, are data entry errors. And I mean, literally, these are just errors in entering the data. Well, sometimes we can diagnose that just by looking at this scatter plot because we see that this point is so different from the rest. We see that this point is so different from the rest. We can go pull the original data and see if we made a mistake. Well, let's say that there was. Let's say that there was a mistake. Let's pull those outliers out of the data set and then recompute a correlation coefficient because now we see a very clear trend and we also see that these data points are conforming very closely to that trend line, suggesting that there's a strong correlation. Well, without those outliers present, the sample correlation now equals approximately 0.97. And as you know, that's a very strong correlation. Now, I want to make sure you don't get the wrong idea here. The decision to remove outliers from our data really can't be taken lightly. When I say we can't cherry pick our data, we can't look at a data point and say, oh, that doesn't fit my theory, I'm going to delete it. The data is the data, but in this particular case, we were assuming that we made a data entry error, and the scatter plot helped us recognize that. Let me give you a couple other examples about how correlations can sometimes be somewhat tricky to make sense of. Let's look at some data here, looking at two variables. This is the hours of TV that some students, high school students, are watching per week. And then also right here we have their associated GPAs, their grade point averages. Now, if we were to take all this data and reduce it to a scatter plot, you'd see that we don't necessarily see some easy to interpret trend. It's kind of difficult to determine an average trend line with this data, somewhat suggesting that there 
isn't much of a correlation at all. I mean, maybe I'm able to discern somewhat of a trend line, but the data clearly don't conform well with that trend line. And if I were to actually crunch the numbers, we'd find a very modest, very small, very weak negative correlation of about 0.06. So it's pretty close to zero. Well, this is what makes it interesting. If we were to look at the data by grouping it in a particular way, because not all programming on TV is equal. I mean, the point that it seems like researchers often try to make here is that people spend a lot of time watching mindless TV and that affects their grades, you know, for several reasons. One reason just being that they're, they're taking up time that they could be taking up studying. But we know that not all programming is equal. Some of it's entertainment and it's somewhat just mindless, but some of it's very educational. So let's break out the data into two groups. Here we're looking at group one. In general, these kids watch educational programs and we see the number of hours per week that they're spending watching TV and their GPAs. And in the second group, they're just watching regular TV, which we're gonna assume right now is just mostly entertainment type of TV, somewhat mindless TV. Here we see the number of hours per week that they're watching TV and their grade point averages. And now let's look at that data in a scatter plot for this group and in a separate scatter plot for that group. So when we look at the group right here who are watching educational programs, now I'm starting to see a more clear trend. And you can see that's what's shown in this part of the data. So we're, we're starting to see it. There are two groups represented in this data and because they were all put together, the interpretation was somewhat washed out. If I fit a trend line to this, it's clearly a positive correlation. We see it heading uphill. That's characteristic of a positive correlation. And those data points are, are conforming to this trend line pretty tightly. So it's a relatively strong correlation. If we were to crunch those numbers, we'd find a strong positive correlation of 0.86. And look at what we see here. Now when we're looking at this data and we're seeing the number of hours per week that they're watching this entertainment type of programming, now I'm seeing a trend line that looks a little bit different from what we see to the left over here. Here the trend line is clearly heading down. That's characteristic of a negative correlation. And again, these data points are very closely conforming to that trend line, suggesting a strong correlation. Here we have a strong negative correlation of negative 0.95. So what's the bottom line? Is that sometimes groupings of variables kind of get in the way and obscure relationships that exist. When we looked at this data all together, we didn't see much of a relationship, but when we separated the groups, we saw a clear relationship between the two variables. So another thing that's important to discuss, and we've discussed this a little bit already earlier in the semester, is that correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things are correlated doesn't mean one variable causes the other. So this time I want to make sure we really nail it and that we really understand what's going on. I want to talk about three main reasons why correlation doesn't imply causation. And I'll give you some examples as we go. First of all, it's possible that when we compute a correlation, the coefficient that we find, if it's something other than zero, might simply be due to coincidence. So that happens, you know, we, we live in a big world with lots of things we can measure and lots of things going on and some variables are gonna show a correlation simply by coincidence. There's no good reason to explain it. This would be an example. Super Bowl winners often predict stock prices in the year ahead. When an NFC team wins the Super Bowl, stock prices tend to do better the next year. Now, is there any way to really explain that? No one's come up with a really good explanation, and it seems like it's probably just due to a coincidence. There's no good reason to believe that a particular team is gonna influence the stock market. So that's just one example of a, you know, we could just have a coincidence. Here's another reason why we don't want to assume that there's a causal relationship with our correlational data. The variables in question might have some common underlying cause. This is really a key point because with every correlation, this is something we need to worry about. Here's an example. We might find that oat bran, people who eat oat bran, we might find that the more that people eat of this particular food, they have a lower risk of heart disease. So it's a negative correlation. The more oat bran you eat, the lower your risk of heart disease. Now, of course, it's possible that oat bran 
really does have some causal effect, a direct effect on heart disease. But remember, we didn't do an experimental study. We, you know, there are all kinds of other things that could be explaining that pattern of results. For example, people who eat oat bran, you know, not necessarily the sexiest food out there, they might be people who also eat other really healthy foods, and maybe it's those healthy foods that are leading to a lower risk of heart disease. You know, furthermore, people who eat oat bran, they're health conscious, maybe those people exercise a lot. Maybe it's not the diet at all, it's the exercise that's really uh, lowering their risk of heart disease. So do you see what I'm getting at? Because we weren't doing a true experiment, because this is based on a correlational study and we're just looking to see how those two variables relate to one another, there are all kinds of other potential explanations for the results. Here's another good example, another good factor that we need to think about for why correlation does not necessarily imply causation. One variable may actually be a cause of the other, that's possible, but even when this is the case, it may be just one of several causes. Here's an example of that. Smoking causes lung cancer. Well, we know from good experimental studies that smoking does indeed cause lung cancer. And that's with experimental studies with animals. There have never been, or at least there should have never been, smoking studies that are experimental done with human beings. We can't place human beings in a situation, provide some of them with cigarettes and some of them without, and ask them to smoke if we have any thought that it might turn out to be negative for them. That would be unethical. However, those types of studies are done with animals. So we know that smoking causes cancer. There is indeed a causal relationship. But again, we don't want to put too much stock in that because we also know that when it comes to smoking causing cancer, although it is a major factor, there are many other factors as well, such as genetics, um, other environmental toxins, things like this. So it's just one factor. So here's the bottom line that you want to make sure you really understand Whenever you're dealing with correlational research, correlational research is not isolating and testing one variable at a time, not like it is in experimental research. So if we are not isolating and testing one variable at a time, there are always other potential explanations for the results. That's one limitation of correlational research. That's why we always want to be saying to ourselves, correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. All right, here's the bottom line. For all the reasons that we've discussed so far, we have to be really very careful when interpreting correlational data. However, don't get too down on correlational research. Correlational research is awesome research. There are times when we simply cannot do experimental studies, either because it's impractical or impossible um, to study things experimentally. If that's the case, we have to do correlational research, and correlational research will eventually get us to the truth. It just might not be as efficient as experimental research in determining causality. All right, everybody, that's the key content from section 7.2. For now, that is all.